So, welcome everybody. Due to the fact that we are a Zurich uh, association, a Swiss association, I'll switch to German. Afterwards, the presentation will be all in English. Um, also, we come to us. Herzlich freut mich sehr, dass so viele interessierte Anwesende heute hier sind. Um, ich möchte den Akademischen Aviatikverein kurz präsentieren. Um, wer sind wir? Wir haben uns 2014 gegründet, 14.04.2014. Sieht man auch in unserem Logo, Runway 14. Wir, haben, wir waren damals fünf Mitglieder. Momentan sind wir 140 äh, Mitglieder, sind also stark gewachsen über die letzten fünf Jahre. Ähm, wir haben Mitglieder aus den Bereichen Fallschirmspringen, Helikopterflug, Modellflug, aber auch Gleitschirmpiloten, Flugzeug, äh, Flugzeuge, äh, Flugsimulationspiloten, äh, Spotter, Segelflugpiloten. Wir haben alle möglichen Sparten, welche die Luftfahrt ab, äh, abdeckt. Ähm, unsere Mitglieder sind hauptsächlich Studenten aus Zürcher Hochschulen. Und wir haben vier Ziele im Verein. Einerseits möchten wir einen wissenschaftlichen Austausch mit aviatisch Studierenden oder aviatisch interessierten Studierenden schaffen. Wir möchten die Luftfahrt als Gesamtes fördern. Wir möchten kameradschaftliche Beziehungen pflegen und gemeinsam Veranstaltungen organisieren und daran teilnehmen. Wie machen wir das? Wir haben einerseits wissenschaftliche Vorträge. Heute Abend ist beispielsweise ein solcher. Wir führen Betriebsbesichtigungen durch, wir gehen gemeinsam an Airshows, aber auch an Ausstellungen. Wir führen jeden, jeden Monat, jeden ersten Montag des Monats ein Drinking im Bequem durch, hier an der ETH. Zusätzlich führen wir Flyings durch, wir machen aber auch Schnupperflüge, Grillabende und andere Fun Events, wie beispielsweise Laser spielen. Wir haben also ein sehr breites, sehr breites Spektrum an, an verschiedenen Anlässen und dazu habe ich noch einen kurzen Trailer welcher unseren Verein sehr gut zusammenfasst. Können wir den finden? ein Jahr zusammengefasst, und zwar war das das Jahr 2016. Man sieht also, wir haben ein weites Spektrum an verschiedensten Anlässen und wir haben auch dieses Semester wieder ein attraktives Vereinsprogramm zusammengestellt. Ich möchte Ihnen das kurz präsentieren. Wir haben am 25.02., das ist heute, den Vortrag über Risk Management im Base Jump. 
Dann werden wir anfangs März eine Betriebsbesichtigung bei, der, bei den Pilatus-Flugzeugwerken in Stanz durchführen. Ende März haben wir einerseits ein Modellflug-Event, wo Interessierte ähm, in einem Lehrer- und Schülerbetrieb Modellfliegen erlernen können. Und außerdem haben wir noch einen Papierflieger-Wettkampf, wo, 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 wo alle Studierende der ETH und der Universität Zürich sich im Papierfliegen messen können. Einerseits wird die längste Flugdistanz gemessen und andererseits äh, die längste Flugzeit. Dies führen wir in, Zusammen in Zusammenarbeit mit äh, Red Bull durch. Dann haben wir Anfang April unsere Generalversammlung, werden dann die Aero Friedrichshafen besuchen, Mitte April ein Flying, dann Anfang Mai führen wir einen Jubiläumsanlass durch, fünf Jahre am Jartik verein und gegen Ende Mai haben wir noch einen Meteor Workshop organisiert wo sich Interessierte äh, sich im Bereich Meteo weiterbilden können. Wenn Sie jetzt mehr Informationen über unseren Verein äh, noch haben möchten, können Sie unsere Website aviatikverein.ch besuchen. Wir sind auch auf Facebook vertreten und selbstverständlich können Sie uns einfach eine Mail schreiben, um Anfragen zu tätigen. Sie dürfen auch ungeniert an einem Event teilnehmen, wir weiß es nicht. Und freuen uns über jeden Neuzuzug. Neuzug. Neuzuzug. <lacht> Etwas ganz Neues. Ähm, Get on board. Wir haben eine Jumpseat-Plattform programmiert und diese ist jetzt auch online. Falls jemand von euch bei uns mitfliegen möchte, zu attraktiven Konditionen, kann man dies nun über unsere Website buchen. Man kann die Fluchtdaten eingeben, Anzahl Passagiere. Das Ganze ist nicht gewinnmaximierend aufgebaut, sondern wir führen das zu Selbstkostenpreisen durch. Somit hat jeder die Möglichkeit, zu günstigen äh, Konditionen eine Mitfluggelegenheit äh, zu erhalten. Damit komme ich zu unserem letzten Slide. Wir sehen 25.02. Vortrag über Risk Management. Dazu möchte ich gerne an unseren äh, Organisator Victor Roth übergeben. Er hat den ganzen Abend organisiert und wird durch den weiteren Verlauf des Abends führen. Herzlichen Dank. So, uh, I'll switch to English. Um, I've already been uh, translating a little bit to do, so I hope it wasn't distracting. Um, he's from Australia. He is one of the legends of uh, wingsuit base jumping. He has uh, done a lot for the sport, um, starting off with uh, skydiving. He has over 7,000 skydives. Um, started off with some relative work, um, which I'm sure he will maybe talk about, what relative work is, touch on it. Um, then uh, he has, uh, like for example, a Guinness World Record, where uh, 300 skydivers fell at the same time. You have to be very skilled for something like that. <laughs> then uh, additionally to uh, several prizes that he has uh, won in skydiving, he has switched to base jumping and even wingsuit base jumping, which he will also explain the difference of. <clears throat> um, he has different uh, world champion titles in different disciplines of base jumping, um, such as wingsuit um, aerobatics, wingsuit, uh, yeah, okay, distance, <laughs> time, whatever, um, you name it, um, and he has also done... He has also done special things like uh, the human slingshot, which is something that not many base jumpers have done, where he was actually on a launch pad and um, he was shot into the sky with a slingshot. Maybe he's going to show a video. Of course, it's a very visual sport. <laughs> um, so he will um, uh, like uh, um, use a lot of videos, of course, to explain to you how it is. It is a very abstract thing for us to try to imagine. But I'm sure he will uh, kind of get it close, and uh, I don't want to lo lose too many words. Thank you, Sylvan, for the introduction to the Aviation Club. I'm very proud. Um, this is actually the um, first time that we have a skydiver or a base jumper in the Avi Aviation Club for a speech like this, and then a legend of the sport like Dukes, more than 4,000 base jumps, a lot of them wingsuits. Um, I'll give the stage to Dukes. Thank you very much for being here. taking as a little kid, but I didn't know that I was taking risk at the time. 
Uh, I'd always be swinging on ropes, jumping off the roof of the house. And uh, as I grew older, I started skateboarding, surfing, snowboarding, motorbikes, anything to get a bit of a rush. But it was December 5th, 1996, where I thought I was doing the ultimate rush. And that was skydiving. So this was the ultimate in risk taking. Uh, I'll never forget this day. <clears throat> uh, we talked big, but then when it came time, we had to act. And when that door opened of that plane, I pooed my pants, 100%. <laughs> the only reason I remember this skydive is because of the video and the photos. I completely blacked out when I left the plane, and it's a feeling I'll never forget. It's the sensory overload, when your brain takes in more information than it can process, and just shuts down. So it's uh, one of the craziest feelings ever. I landed. And I wanted to do that again. And I did it again, and I fell in love with the sport. I thought it was the ultimate in risk taking, but it was just the tip of the iceberg. Um, soon after, I fell into what you would call the wrong crowd, uh, and I would start to do ground crew for what this sport was called base jumping, which I didn't know much about. Uh, and in May 97, with only about 30 skydives, I went to help out on some people doing a base jump, and they actually handed me a rig and said, do you want to jump? And as a 20 year old boy, I said yes. And this is what happened. We had to land in the water and get picked up by boats. There was cops everywhere. It was chaos and I loved it. <laughs> was, I finally found a, a sport and a place where I felt at home with zero rules. Um, and, and what I thought at the time was extremely high risk. Uh, these two moments, which were accidental moments in my life, absolutely, fundamentally changed the course of my history as a human being. Um, it was the perfect spiral into chaos and adventure that is still going to this day. <laughs>
So here I was all this time thinking I was a risk taker, this crazy risk taker, but really the whole time I was actually all about risk management. If I was just risk taking, I'd be dead. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about why I'm still alive in this sport after 22 years um, and, and how the sport itself has evolved, both in a good way and a bad way, um, and my journey along the way. So um, first I want to talk to you guys about the real risk takers um, and just give you a quick brief history on uh, wingsuiting. So if you guys want to get a more detailed uh, view of it all, definitely check out this book, Birdman, Batman and Skyflies, and it will give you a lot more detailed uh, uh, story. But uh, first of all, uh, these two characters, Franz Reichelt and uh, Clemson, uh, are two people that come to mind uh, for the history of wingsuit base jumping as such. Um, and these guys are the true risk takers and the true pioneers of the sport, not necessarily in a good way. So. First, we're going to talk about Franz, and uh, this is 1912 off the Eiffel Tower. It's the first uh, known wingsuit jump. modifications that needed to be done. Uh, we move on to the next barnstormers, which is, uh, there's a group of about 30 barnstormers back in the, the 30s to 40s, and uh, one of them was Clem Song, uh, who pioneered, again, early wingsuit jumping. <laughs> He actually did quite a number of successful wingsuit skydives, um, as did many of the early Birdmen, uh, but 27 out of the 30 original Birdmen uh, died. Um, it was then a big gap for almost 40 years until a French man, Patrick de Gaillardon, uh, who was a champion skydiver, came to invent what we now know as the modern wingsuit. This is just a short video on him. This is around 1997.
You might have seen a video last year of my friends Fred and Vince doing the exact same thing, and everyone thought that they were the first people to do it. It was actually a tribute to Patrick de Garion, uh from 20 years ago. So, unfortunately, uh, in 1998, he died of a simple rigging error. He actually sewed his wingsuit to his reserve uh, parachute um, accidentally, and then he had a malfunction. His reserve didn't open because it was stitched together. So. Uh, as I'll talk about later in the, in the talk, uh, it's a very simple sport with very simple consequences. Um, during that time, at the same time around, just as Patrick de Gaillon was uh, making the wingsuits, uh, a Croatian skydiving champion, Robert Pechnik, was also playing around with wingsuits. Um, and he, in my, besides Patrick, Robert is the absolute original gangster of modern day wingsuit flying. Uh, he is still flying and testing and, and making wingsuits to this day. Um, he's been a good friend of mine for many years and these are the wingsuits uh, he has produced. So he started out uh, making a company called Birdman and then when that didn't work out because of his partner, he started another company called Phoenix Fly. And it's Robert Pechnik only who's really developed the sport in his backyard as a passion for him over the last nearly 20 years. There's a, just a short video on, on him. My name is Robert Pechnik. I'm coming from Croatia. I'm a skydiver and a base jumper. I started about 30 years ago. I have about uh, 6,500 skydivers and 1,100 base jumpers. I was uh, pretty much done with my skydiving uh, RW four-way career and then uh, somehow wings to jump in a new thing, and this drawn me into the, into the wings. What I like about wings of flying is that uh, it's actually really like sensation of flying. Before, no matter what, it was not falling. And this is something which um, is really special. And especially special when you come closer to the object. You're, so you're flying with something or you're flying uh, next to something. And then you really feel like maybe it sounds a little bit kind of like a, uh, something you heard a hundred times, but it's really like you feel like a bird. And he's very true. And it's very hard to explain to people, but once the wingsuits came about, you actually do feel like you're flying. When you're skydiving, you have nothing around you that you can actually... Uh, see the relative uh, the relative speed you're doing, but once you start base jumping and you start flying close to things, you actually feel the relative uh, speed to what you're doing. Uh, this came about actually back in 2003 uh, by another Frenchman, Louis Jean Albert, who was an absolute pioneer of every aspect of skydiving and base jumping. And his video that I'll show you in a second literally changed the course of wingsuit history. Initially, wingsuits were designed and built so that you could safely fly away from the object. Um, we were at the World Championships in France at the time, uh, and on the big screen, he put the next video on, and it blew 2,000 people away. And it's very poor quality, but I'll show you this video now. So whilst, whilst not much by today's standards, think back in 2003, this absolutely blew the world away and it created the chaos that is we're seeing now called proximity flying. All of a sudden, anything was possible. Uh, but if proximity flying wasn't enough, it would get crazier still. And now there's a race 
to land the wingsuit. And uh, many people were attempting it uh, with expensive contraptions and all sorts of things, but it was actually an English stuntman, Gary Connery, with very little wingsuiting experience, that put out 18,000 cardboard boxes and attempted to have a go. <laughs> He survived. <laughs> Since then, there have been a few people that have also landed wingsuits, but accidentally. <laughs> a couple of them also survived. And if that wasn't crazy enough, people started wanting to hit targets and flying through smaller and smaller holes in the earth and fire hoops and all sorts of stuff. So uh, this was in 2013 uh, and there's even more since. It seemed like anything was possible. It felt like everyone was invincible and there was no limits to what we could do. But the body count was rising and it was rising super fast. Um, in 2016 alone, there was 40 base jumping deaths. 20 of them were friends of mine in one year. So the sport started to get a reputation as being just out of control and loose. Uh, things had to change. And I'll talk about that a bit later. But for the moment, let's just have a talk about how wingsuits actually work. And as you can see from this video, there's quite a few different types of wingsuits. And these are just my personal ones. So, most importantly, is to, which we'll talk about later, is to use the right tool for the job. So I have three different types of suits here, which I'll talk about later. But at the moment, for the proximity flying and for all the hardcore stuff, this is the suit of choice. So uh, this is the equivalent of a fighter jet. Um, it's very twitchy, it's very fast, it can do up to 300 kilometers an hour. Um, it's very scary and it's very fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, the way it works is with Ram Air technology. Uh, it's okay, it's fine. Uh, Ram Air technology, same as a parachute works. So you need air to come into the suit to fill it. And we'll have, this suit itself I think has over 150 different pieces and takes about 27 hours completely to build. Um, it's the cutting edge of wingsuits um, and it's called the Sukhoi. Um, like in any aircraft, it has a leading edge. Okay. Um, what we are limited to as human beings is we're not built to fly. So we're limited uh, by our arms and we're limited by our parachutes because not all of us want to land in cardboard boxes every time. So we could make this out of uh, carbon fibre, but then we cannot open our parachute, which is critical to, to be able to do it again. So here is the vents. Uh, the air rushes in, and then we'll have air locks in here that actually lock the air in. And the latest suit that didn't arrive in time will have a green, orange, and red zipper, depending on how hardcore you want to fly. So obviously the stronger the leading edge, the, the faster and more rigid you can fly. So they'll have that in each arm with some grippers to hold on to. And then also in the leg wing, we'll have ram air as well with, with more vents, uh, sorry, more ribs. Um, for this suit in particular, there's also a hole 
with a deflector on the back. And this will allow for air to pass through to create less turbulence and it'll come out of the back and make you be able to steer a lot more precisely. Um, on all other wingsuits, with all other brands, uh, you'll have your feet as rudders. So um, if you do not have uh, fins on a surfboard, the surfboard is out of control. So we also have fins on our wingsuits. So, and what this does, it can get you on a straight line when you need to turn, you can actually turn like you're on rails, like you're on a box sled. So, and for safety, uh, we'll have some nice grippers. So, the thing with the wingsuits is when you start out on base jumping, and I focus more on base jumping because I didn't do so much skydiving with the wingsuits, um, you actually start out with no air. So, you've got to let that air build up and you've got to fly the suit as the air builds up in, in relative. So, and then when you're going to deploy, you have so much air in there. And you're going so fast, you actually need to slow that wing suit down as well. So, and after the talk, uh, feel free to come up and we can go through all this in more detail. Um, I can talk about it forever, but we'll get back to it. Um, the the wing suit really depends on the type of flying you're going to do. So, if you're going to do, this is what, what I would call an intermediate suit. Uh, this is a beginner suit, and that's a very much advanced suit. Um, so... I'm going to talk now about my evolution of flight because when I started uh, skydiving, there was none of this. Okay, it was it was a taboo sport base jumping. Uh, none of these suits were invented yet, um, and and things have evolved over the last twenty years. So um, when we started skydiving, we did what you call relative work. So four of us uh, turning points in a certain amount of time. Most points wins. So. Uh, well, we made our name for this team um, that got us to an eight-way team where we ended up at the World Championships. Um, but after each skydive, to get away safely, you don't want to be opening your parachutes like this. You want to be able to fly away from each other into safety. And that's called tracking. So tracking is similar to flying an aeroplane, but you're just flying your body. And tracking is in a position like this. Um, toes pointed, as rigid as you can, on the perfect angle to create the perfect glide for your style of body shape um, and, and these days with the suit. So it was the absolute favourite part of my jump. Leaving the aircraft and finishing the, the, the jump every single time. We'd always, we wouldn't really separate so much sometimes because we'd be racing each other up for every jump. So, um, and back in the day with base jumping, uh, one thing that's changed now is we were skydivers that base jumped. So we were skydiving all the time, the generations before us were skydiving all the time. So we were always current in the air. So base jumping, it was just more of a lifestyle than a sport then. So we were taking our skydiving skills into base jumping. Whereas nowadays, uh, people skydive to base jump. And that's one of the reasons there's, a, there's been an influx of accidents. So, but after our first world championships, uh, we went to Norway and uh, coming from Australia where everything was illegal and everything was low, all of a sudden we're at these 3,000 foot cliffs and it was incredible. And, um, we had no suits, so we were just flying our bodies. Uh, at this particular cliff, um, I did a jump beforehand and just being young and stupid, I did a backflip and flew. I um, was having such a good time tracking that I didn't open my parachute where I should have and had to land in an alternative landing area. But being from Australia, the trees are fine. Um, I went to the... I went to the, 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 uh, the boss of the whole area who, who pioneered this whole sport very innocently and I said, hey, what's the longest delay that uh, anyone's done from this cliff? And he said, oh, no, you can only do 12 seconds from there. I did 16 once, but there's no way you could do any more than this. I said, I just did 20 with a backflip. <laughs> and uh, he's like, whoa. Yeah. And I said, would you mind if I go up and try and actually fly all the way to the water? And, and he's such a cool guy, so absolutely go for it. And uh, so I did. And uh, this is the video. So this, uh, this jump sort of, there was no social media back then, it was word of mouth, so this jump got around um, and uh, this was sort of the beginning of 
be more tracking. And over the next couple of years, uh, a lot of different suit designs of, of uh, without the classic suit here were developed, including uh, smoke pants, which is where you actually get some rain pants, put smoke holes in them, tie them up, and then they inflate. So this is sort of the beginning of all that. And um, because word got around, the next year, and obviously I fell in love with this tracking, um, the next year when we were at the world record for the 300 way, the same guy, Robert Pechnik, had heard about this and uh, we got chatting about wingsuits and this and that and I was super new at it and um, he looked me up and down and he gave me this suit. I've never ever been measured for a wingsuit in my life. He was that good. He just looked at me, okay Dukes, you will be good in this one. And off I went. And um, this is a prototype, and pretty much ever since, I've only ever got prototypes. Um, he'll test them on me and then sell them to the public if they work. Um, I did not know this at the time. Uh, I thought this was a bit of a suit. But uh, yeah, so this is still while he was with Birdman. Um, there was no knowledge about wingsuiting there, especially at our drop zone. Um, so I did about I don't know, 20, 30 skydives. We didn't know how to fly, we didn't know that you had to fly fast. We, it was all about staying in the air as much as possible and, and enjoying the feeling. And um, so I did a few skydives and then I thought, cool, let's take it to the cliffs of Europe. Um, so for the 2003 season, uh, I jumped the cliffs, uh, I jumped the Eiger for the first time, one of the first to jump that, and uh, the cliffs of Norway and Italy. Um, but I was shit scared. I was really, really scared because you're trapped. What you don't realise in a wingsuit, you're in a straight jacket. So for any sort of skydiving, you always use your arms and you always use your legs. But for this, you're completely trapped into this position. And same for the pool. So um, I did a lot of jumps that season, probably 30 or 40 wingsuit jumps. And I already then realised if I kept doing this, I was going to die. So I gave up wingsuiting over the big suits for the next six years and I went back to tracking something I was good at. So, um, and I think that move saved my life uh, and recognising your own uh, abilities or inabilities um, without the knowledge uh, is a really good thing that I'm trying to share with my school, with my students now. So, so basically over that year the smoke pants came in um, I became chief instructor in Norway teaching base jumping and the two-piece tracking suit came out. So we were the first to get the test, test suits. It started with the pants. Um, they're very similar to this, even after 15 years, these have not changed so much. Um, and then we got the jacket. So this was the same as slick tracking, except you had more surface area. Still using the Ram Air technology as such. Um, but it enabled you to have a little bit more surface area, which gives you more power. But with more power comes more responsibility. And so you need to be able to fly your body first before you put a big suit on. So um, this next video is just a quick video to show you the speeds that you can get to on these suits. Um, and then this was actually after we started base jumping them. I went back and did a few skydives on them. <laughs> So, um, but it was 2004 and 2005 where myself and my best friend Coombsy, we were living in the same area. And this place is Chirag, Norway, which was the mecca for big wall base jumping back in the day. Um, we took everything that we saw from Louis in 2003 with the wingsuit, and because we were living there and jumping every day, we put this into tracking. Um, and again, as I say, the feeling of flying close to something uh, is the feeling of a race car driver driving as fast as you can around a racetrack. So um, none of this had ever been done before. We didn't even know. We were just busy having fun. We worked together and we trained hard. 
Um, in the end, Coombsy's tracking got so good, we ended up pioneering uh, a little mini wings for my tracking suit. Uh, so I could get the, the, the edge on him on the beginning and then fly with him to get some filming. And it's, um, to be able to film and fly at the same time is quite tricky, but with a lot of teamwork and a lot of training, we're able to start doing this sort of stuff. And we, again, we didn't realise it until we put our footage, we were, we were super broke. We put our footage into a video competition um, and we won a free canopy and we didn't realise it, but we had blown the world away because we, it actually hadn't been done before, so. So these are the days of VHS. So it went viral, but on VHS. So it's very <laughs> different uh, to how it is now. Um, and as dangerous as some of that looked, it was actually quite a safe environment because it was vertical walls. So at any time we could always peel out to the right. So what we learned was that with the tracking suits, you have the speed, but you don't have the range. So, uh, those two years were amazing. And the next year, um, Coombsy went to the troll wall in Norway where the walls were a bit flatter. Um, and it was the start of the season, so he was uncurrent. And he died at the troll wall uh, in about, I think it was about May 2006. And um, yeah, there is limits and he pushed them. And I never got to see my, my best friend again. Um, I still kept doing this proximity tracking for a little bit because like, like in life, you know, it can never happen to you. Um, <laughs> but after a near miss for myself as well, where I had to relax and breathe for a few seconds when I was in a no-pull situation, um, I realised that if I didn't pull back the throttle, I was going to die as well. So it's very difficult to go back to the kiddies pool after you've been surfing pipeline. Um, and it was a very hard transition to make. Um, but making that transition and widening my perspective was way more important to me than dying. So, and what it comes down to, which I didn't realise for 10 years prior, was it's about ego management. And so after this point in time, until this day now, constantly working and helping others with ego management. So every single person in this room has an ego. We need one, we need confidence. It's super important. Hesitation will kill you and so will arrogance. So, but, you need to use your ego wisely. And so I'm gonna go through just a few key things um, that have helped me stay alive over the last forever and hopefully continue to do that. Uh, the first is knowing your limits, your limits, not the limits. We learned by all the deaths in wingsuiting that there are limits. They're not necessarily your limits. Complacency, which we all get complacent in various aspects of our lives. The weather, especially all you guys that are into air sports, oh, she'll be right, you know, I made it yesterday. Uh, weather is crucial for wingsuit flying. Uh, knowledge, training, and time in sport. Choosing the right tool for the job, okay, and fear. So there's a lot more key points to this, but I'm just gonna focus on these ones briefly. 
And the first one is knowing your limits. So just because someone is a world champion at something doesn't mean that you are going to be a world champion at something. So you have to learn your limits. Um, whenever I do something, whenever I jump off a cliff, I commit 100%. It's crucial to commit 100%, but I don't run at 100%. Okay, I've dropped down to 70%, and these days I'll only run at 30 to 50% of what I'm capable of. Because every now and then, as a human being, we make mistakes and we need to spike. My friends that were continuously running at 100% all die. So for me, it's important to always run well below what you're capable of, because at the end of the day, who, who are you trying to prove? You know, you're only looking at yourself in the mirror, and I know that if I land safely from a jump, I'm winning. Um, it's also important to remember that what we do is not normal. We think it's normal, and I'm way more happier up there than I am here, but there's seven, other, seven billion other people who will probably disagree with me. So that's really important to, to understand. Uh, the second is complacency, and it's probably the biggest killer in, in our sport at the moment, and it's something I'm most scared about myself because I have so much experience in the sport. So I'm more scared than ever that I'll get complacent and forget something at some point. Um, and it really has killed a lot of the top pilots. Here's a really good example of one of my best friends. Um, this thing up here, this is a pilot chute. This opens your parachute. If you look over there on the rig, that's a pilot chute there. Without that pilot chute, you cannot open your parachute. It cracks the air and extracts the rest of your gear. Uh, one of my best friends, who's one of the most experienced jumpers in the sport, who was also with one of the most experienced jumpers in the sport, didn't do their checks. And somehow, even though deemed impossible, he jumped without his pilot chute even on. Scary. Here's the video. So we knew about this, but he didn't tell his wife for two years. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, and, and I would regard this person as one of the safest guys in the sport, and yet it happened to him. So um, I'll just give you one more quick example, and I'll make sure you look up at the top, but I'll play this twice. There's one of the most famous space jumpers in the world. Uh, through complacency, forgot to do one leg zip up on his wingsuit. So just one of the leg zips, he put his booty in, and it was stretched and it was tight, but he didn't do his leg zip up. Forgot, cameras are rolling, big film crew, big production, what's at stake, and he jumped without knowing. He was meant to do a barrel roll close to the terrain halfway through the jump, but for the, because he wasn't feeling it with the wind, he waited until the end of the jump, and this was the result. <laughs> So his skill got him out of trouble, but had he done that next to a cliff, obviously we know what would happen. So I'll play it again because it's interesting to watch. So these are, these are very powerful suits, as you can see. They're powerful in a good way, and they're powerful in a bad way. So triple check your gear. Uh, for all the aviation people here, probably everyone, it's really important to have a good understanding of the weather, um, especially with wingsuiting um, and any area of sport. You can never know enough about the weather. Um, even when you think you know about the weather, it will catch you out every time. So every time I've cut a little corner on the weather or something like this, something's bitten me in the arse. So, um, and for wingsuiting, you really need an understanding of micrometeorology. So we're flying at glide ratios of up to three to one. So we can fly the height we're jumping. So we're jumping from the Eiger, 
we can fly all the way to Grindelwald. But sometimes they're flying around corners and when we're proximity flying, there's a lot of thermals, there's a lot of lift, there's a lot of heat, there's a lot of sink. And so it's really important to get an understanding of that. Um, and the earth and the mountains are always breathing. So in the evenings and the mornings, you'll have catabatic wind. So we're just coming down the mountain. Around, say, at least where we live, around 10, 10 a.m., 11 a.m., everything will go neutral till about 12, 12 midday. Um, and then the anabatic winds will start coming in and the valley winds. So um, a lot of people, especially in this, these days, like to fly in high thermal wind, wind because they get the lift, so they get more performance. But this adds a lot of dangers. If you're coming around a corner and you hit a rotor, um, a micro rotor, or uh, a little bit of thermal lift or sink, um, the consequences can be deadly. And so people that are re repeating the same jumps over and over again, they're thinking that the weather conditions are gonna be the same every single day. And it's actually killed quite a lot of people through not understanding the weather. For me personally, I like to jump in neutral conditions. I only trust one thing in this world, and that's myself. So when I, whenever I start my hikes, I'll look at the optimal weather time and I'll hike, generally I'll be hiking in maybe up to 10 knots of catabatic wind and you always wonder, like, oh, it's bad wind, it's bad wind. But you've got to trust the mountains and trust uh, the way the wind works. So by the time I get to the top, uh, at say 10 to 11 a.m., it'll be nice neutral conditions and I can jump. Um, these days you have apps, weather apps, and especially in Switzerland, they're super accurate. Um, if there's any sort of marginal conditions, just don't go up. You know, or walk down, but generally don't have to go up. And that's really crucial um, for the people that are coming over to Europe, just for their two weeks. They've got their list of 20 jumps that they need to do, and they must do it no matter what. Don't be in a rush to die. Just walk away. There's heaps of other cool stuff to do, especially in this country. Um, next is knowledge, training, and time in sport. So, I was very lucky. I was a 20 year old base jumper, but there, none of this was invented. So we got to invent it ourselves. We got to pioneer most of the things, uh, modern day base jumping. So our learning curve was super slow, like this. Thank goodness. And even to this day, my learning curve is like this. With the young guys now, people getting into the sport, they have everything at their fingertips. They have, press a button, you can buy a, a parachute. Press another button, you can get a wingsuit. Press another button, you've got YouTube, and, and all of a sudden you think you're invincible, but you haven't got the knowledge of training and the time in sport. So it's really important uh, to take that time to learn. And this is a prime example of someone that didn't take the time to learn and wanted to be like the YouTube heroes. Um, halfway through this video, it speeds up, just because it's a very long jump, um, but then you'll see the consequences towards the end. Okay, au revoir. Au revoir. Listen to the speed. He lived. Crazy, but true. He had time the whole Towards the end there, he had time to go left, he had time to leave, but he didn't have the speed. And when you fly your wingsuit, you want to be on this angle one, I'll get to that in a sec. If you're starting to have trouble, your natural instinct is to look up. What happens when you look up? You start flaring up, and you go slower, and then you're sinking out more, and you look up more, sinking out more, and he ran out of time. But it's people like him, and there's many out there, that are ruining the sport for people like us. Um, because of that accident and quite a few other accidents in the area, the whole Chamonix has been shut down. And once a law is made, it's very hard to take back that law. There's three key things to staying alive in a wingsuit. A good exit, fly fast, so you have an out, and open high, so you can deal with any sort of malfunctions. So um, if you want to escape Tony Hawk's mega ramp, 
you've got to be a good skateboarder. If you want to jump off a cliff, you can jump off a cliff. Easy. It's only bad when it goes wrong. That's where the skill of wingsuiting and base jumping comes into um, comes into play. So anyone can base jump, but to be a good base jumper, you need to do the training and get the knowledge. Had he have known the glide, he would have known the speed to stay at and how to get out of that situation. So you guys understand glide. Um, every single suit we have has a different glide ratio. For terrain flying with the big suit, the Sukhoi, your optimal glide is 1.8 to 2.2. So that's 1.8 meters forward for every meter down. And you're doing in excess of 200 kilometers an hour. Any more glide than that, and you're putting yourself in a danger zone for if you need to get up over something or if you create sink. So back in the old days, you just listen to the speed. Yeah, 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 I'm going fast, I'm going fast, yeah, yeah. Now, things don't lie. <laughs> so we have a thing called a fly site now, which tracks your GPS data and will tell you exactly the speed you're doing, exactly the glide ratio, and exactly how you're flying. So the sport has gotten quite technical in, in that aspect as the cliffs have gotten more and more technical to jump. So I won't get too technical in it, but I'll just give you an example. This is what we show our students that are learning to wingsuit fly. Um, and this is how we teach them whether a jump is safe enough for their skill level or not. I'll just read off here. But basically, get the total altitude of the jump, and we can do this from Google Earth, subtract the exit height and the pull safe opening height, which is around 150 metres, calculate the distance of flight to the opening area, to where you need to be to open safely, and then divide the distance by the height. So if you're, depending on your skill level, if that answer ends up being 1.8 to 2.2, you're relatively safe to go and jump that jump in good conditions. But if you're here in a 3 to 1 or 3.1 to 1, alarm bell should start ringing and you shouldn't be doing that sort of jump. It brings me on to choosing the right tool for the job. So I've used skydiving in this case because I learned an expensive lesson. Um, when we fly skydiving parachutes, we fly quite small, quite fast. Um, and with base jumping, we fly very big, docile parachutes. But they're expensive. And so at the time, I had a medium-sized parachute, which is a 120 square foot, but it was quite high performance. And with the wingsuit, you're creating a lot of drag when you open your parachute. So the drag and having the complexity of the skydiving rig will actually give you a lot more drag and turbulence and actually make your parachute twist up. So uh, basically I was coaching, I was gonna get 600 euros for the weekend. Um, I had my rig and I had a cutaway, but I had to keep coaching. So I borrowed someone's rig that had a similar parachute, even worse, um, and had to cut that away. And I had a little malfunction on my reserve, lost the parachute, lost everything. It cost me 3,600 euros. And I didn't skydive again for another 12 months until I got the correct gear. You'll hear my fear in the second part now. Remembering you're always trapped in your suit. That was fun. I laughed. It was good, good times. It happened. The next one was not fun. <laughs> so long for me to cut away is that I didn't want to lose that parachute. It was green and yellow and there's cornfields everywhere and I lost that parachute for six weeks 
and it was brilliant. So, um, yeah, as I said, I didn't skydive again for another 12 months after that. I was like, forget it, not until I can afford to get the right parachute for the job. And I wouldn't say that that was crazy dangerous because these are doable. It was a one in a thousand chance, but it happened. Uh, also, just got to talk about fear. So, um, what a lot of people don't know about me is that I'm scared shitless all the time at everything. So, but you'll never see that on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook because it takes too long to put me being scared. In. It's way better to show the cool photos, you know. Um, but one of the main things that's kept me alive over the years is being shit scared of everything. And so um, that enables me to know my limits and to stop being complacent. So I'm renowned all over the world by everyone for triple checking my gear. I'll do 100 tricks every jump. And, uh, and it's important because a lot of people don't do that. And, and for this, this is one example, and I'm sure some people have seen the full video, but this guy, no fear, um, and he absolutely forgot to put his leg straps on. And he was about to jump, and I just happened to pick it up um, and save his life. So it was certain death. And there's actually been a few base jumpers over the years, a few wingsuit pilots, um, that have actually forgot to put their leg straps on, chest straps, things like this, and the wingsuits actually save them. So again, for us, this feels normal, but we also have to remember it's not normal at all. So this guy here was the head cardiologist for the Royal Family of Saudi Arabia. So, yeah, muppet. Um, <laughs> so, this, is a, this, is, this is interesting. So I put this in because it's a personal story of can you be too safe? So back in 2008, when the wingsuits were changing, um, I had an issue with my pilot chute. So again, the pilot chute is what pulls out the main parachute. Now you have to remember when you're flying a wingsuit, you're flying across the ground. But if shit goes wrong, your horizontal speed very fast turns into vertical speed. And what a lot of people forget is they're looking over here and not seeing what's down here. So I, the video's online, um, you can check it out. It took me three goes to find my pilot chute. And on the third go, I knew this was my last chance. So I took a deep breath, remained calm, opened my parachute, and still had seven seconds under canopy, so that's quite a long time in base jumping. Um, but just a couple of months later, my friend died from exactly the same thing. So I've never gotten over the mental gain of that. As, as I said before, I don't do this to die, I do this to live. Um, and when things like that happen, that makes me question everything. So uh, it's still in my brain. And so this next video I'm gonna show you is can you be too safe? So um, just before, this is two separate uh, jumps but the same line. Um, and just a week, a week or two before this, a friend of ours died in Norway by not being able to get to his pilot chute. So once again, besides my incident, his incident was in my head as well. And I'll show you on the first angle. You'll see it's, it's, it looks hardcore, but it's very steep. It's like a 1.5 glide ratio, it's super safe. Um, so we can play around, but when you see the back angle, I want you to focus on the pilot chute. Can everyone see that? Really important to focus on the pilot chute because this is probably the closest I've ever come to potentially dying. Base jump that's safe. Maybe not for you guys, but if we pass that over to the safe line. Perfect conditions. So I always stick my pilot chute out just a little bit more so I never forget, so I never have that problem that I used to have. Watch what happens in flight with aggressive flying.
don't know what would have happened then. I had no idea. I was having the time of my life. Um, that, for me, is being too safe. So having that little extra inch of policy out to make sure I was able to grab it on full time potentially nearly killed me. So we'll never know. But what's important, especially with everything in base jumping and in life, is to be able to identify when you're lucky. It's crucial to me staying alive, to identify when you're lucky. I looked at that after the jump and I was like, holy shit, that could have been it. It might have been fine, but it definitely could have been it. So I stopped jumping uh, wingsuits for over 12 months. I actually gave up wingsuits altogether at that point. The risk became uh, higher than the reward for me, and that was it, I was done. So, uh, and, um, yeah, it's quite scary. The little things uh, what you have to make, pay most attention to, but even when done safely, extreme sports are dangerous. So, um, Is cross-sporting safe? It's very opinionated, but I think absolutely. Um, anyone that loves being in the air loves to do all sports, whether it be free flying, paragliding, flying planes, choppers, it's all related, but it all needs a healthy respect. They're all sister sports. Um, you need to have an understanding for each sport in its own right, and then you'll have a general understanding for all sports. Um, the most important thing is to remember all the points that I talked about just before and identify with them with every sport you do. Because we have to remember that we are not risk takers, we're risk managers. So no matter what the sport is, we need to manage that risk. Uh, the future of human flight. As you saw from the history, if you had have asked me 15 years ago what would we be doing in Wing City, I'd have no idea. And I still don't have any idea. But I'll just go through a few things that uh, have been shaping over the last sort of four or five years and maybe where it'll head. Um, the World Wingsuit League, so we're doing wingsuit racing now. Head to head, flying as fast as we can around different circuits um, and even flying through targets to see who is the winner. Uh, it's very intense, it's something we dreamed of back in the day. It's actually become a reality. Uh, super fun, but super intense. Uh, and I retired from it. <laughs> but um, there's also another thing that we did for a while, which is called the Red Bull Aces. Um, even more intense. Uh, and it really showed um, how, how you need, needed to train skydiving to become good at these sports. So um, the Red Bull Aces was from Red Bull. Uh, we had four of us jumping out of a Huey helicopter, uh, racing around four other helicopters with pylons hanging down from them, with two other helicopters in the air shooting Cineflex um, in a desert environment where you couldn't see the helicopters. And uh, we also had electronics all over us because it was live TV. We had smoke, we had shit everywhere, and I was petrified. So it's, um, and during one of the races, actually, because you're that focused on the flags, I actually ended up colliding with a friend of mine and broke my ribs. Um, did one of the most stupid things I've ever done in my life was go back up and do a second jump because I got through the next round. But that got me the money to pay for my hospital bills. So, so <laughs> I wouldn't do it again. But here's a quick video just to give you an idea of the Red Bull Aces and their reaching speeds of basically 300 kilometers an hour. Here. <laughs> It truly was like racing, it was proper racing lines and it was very intense. 
Um, another thing that's been take, becoming more and more popular over the last years is uh, XRW, which is called Extreme Relative Work and just Acro Flying. Um, it's where you're combining parachutes and wingsuits. So it's quite safe in the skydiving environment, but in the base jumping environment, it's quite dangerous and it's taken a few lives already. But here's just a little quick video to give you an example of what we do. Also, a recent, um, a recent uh, thing in, in flying has been the one-piece tracking suits. And for me personally, this has been my personal joy to help develop this suit. Um, this is a one-piece tracking suit, or a onesie. Uh, it brings me back to the days where I was flying with Coombsy doing the tracking, but a lot safer. So essentially, this is almost like a wingsuit, but without wings. So once again, I can run. I can put my hands in the air. It's extremely safe, but it's you feel like you're driving a muscle car at 240 k's an hour so, and you're still getting uh, up to 2.6 glide ratio on this thing. So for me personally, this has been my favourite addition to the sport since way back in 2003 and 2004. And here's just a quick video to show these things in action. This changes sport again for me. So after being in the sport for 20 years, I feel like a little kid again, and it's my favourite toy. It's opened up a lot of new jumps for me. Um, as I said before, uh, I gave up wingsuiting. Too dangerous. What I hated was the exit and the opening, but the flying part was epic. So how do you do that? And um, in the last uh, year and a half, the first ever indoor wingsuiting tunnel opened up in Sweden and changed everything for me personally. So. Um, now we're able to fly our wingsuits in a safe environment, relatively safe. I've hit every part of the tunnel on various occasions trying to learn. Um, because I've had no formal training over the years, you, you get into a lot of bad habits. And when I went into the tunnel, I knew I was going to be bad. I didn't realise it was going to be that bad. So it's a complete new learning experience for me. And as you can see here, it's pretty rough. But this actually got me back into wingsuiting and gave me the confidence again to take wingsuiting back out of the plane and then back into base jumping in a, in a safer environment. Um, yeah, the, the beauty of this, two, two things, any one of you guys can do it and within an hour you'll be able to fly by yourself and within two hours you can fly with your friend. The other thing is that instead of using 18,000 cardboard boxes, we can take off and land wherever, whenever we like. And that, for me, is an incredible feeling. And you don't have to open the parachute. So it's cut out all the things I don't like and made it super fun. So here's just a quick video. And uh, if you watch at the end, I had the honour of trying uh, the original wingsuit design of Luigi John Alpert 
from 2003 to see if it would actually fly. So, yeah, epic, and I encourage you all to try the fear of in Stockholm. Um, what's my future in base jumping? My future, I feel blessed to have got through this journey so far. Um, so my future is prevention through education. Um, I've started back in, although I've been teaching since 2003 off and on, uh, late 2014 I started to learn to base jump with my friend Lisa after a triple wing suit fatality, killed her husband and two other friends of ours. So, um, I have the experience now, I have the knowledge now, um, and I'm still young enough where people might listen to me. Um, so I try and be the cool uncle rather than the shitty parent saying no, no, no. So um, I've now teamed up with legendary wingsuit flyer Sam Hardy, who is probably the best cameraman of wingsuiting in the world. Incredible human being, just has the same passion as me, um, more enthusiasm, which is hard to keep up with him, um, and he's an incredible teacher. So we run now seven courses, uh, focusing mostly on uh, initial base jumping um, and what started as a bit of a hobby has turned into a full-blown uh, business now um, and recently with Sam on board he's our head wingsuit guy so we now offer three wingsuit courses um, again prevention 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 that's our word um, now what we're trying to do instead of having the accidents we're trying to prevent them so the first course is wingsuit for base so what we do now is we get the guys we sit skydiving just like they would be if they were base jumping. So we get them to have clean exits, fly fast and open safely. Um, it's really important so they can take the next step into wingsuit actual base jumping. Uh, last year we started running the first proper ever wingsuit first jump courses um, and we're very strict on who we take. So you have to have a minimum, we call the triple twos, uh, 200 wingsuit skydives, which is quite a lot. Uh, two years in base jumping and 200 normal base jumps. So uh, if you want to learn any different to that, go for it. It just won't be with us. Um, we're strict to our rules and we never knew what would happen, but people are actually starting to turn the corner now because of all the accidents back then and people are actually starting to want to. So, and now we have over 400 pages of all the 20 years that's been in here and Sam's 15 years and we're writing everything down to create the first real uh, curriculum for base jumping and we base jumping. Uh, this year, because of all the accidents that have been happening over the last years, we're going to run our first ever wingsuit advanced course. Um, Sam's going to be running this and I'll be there as well, where we can actually teach the fundamentals of proximity flying in a safe working environment uh, with a different tasks at hand. The tricky part's going to be 
that base jumpers don't want to pay for anything. So, but the sport is slowly changing where people actually want to get expert instruction now. And hopefully we are the guys that are changing that. So for me, it's been an incredible 20 plus year journey. And we want to um, give that to the new generation without the bloodshed of losing over 100 friends. So it's really important for us to share our knowledge so that they can do things like this. I never thought I'd be in a position where I could give words of wisdom ever. But at the end of each base jumping course, I give my students two pieces of advice. The first, you can always earn more money, but you can never get back your time. So it's critical, no matter what you do, to have fun doing it and get a job later. The second is, and the most important, that there can only ever be one world champion at any one sport at any one time. But you can always be your own world champion in anything you do, all the time. The key is to be able to smile and survive. But most importantly, to get home safe each day so you can be happy like this guy. <laughs> Thank you very much. absolute honor to have a pioneer and a legend of the sport to this state uh, here in front of us. Thank you very much. Cheers. This is a little present and a signed card. Oh, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Awesome. There you go. Cheers. Um, thank you. Yes. Um, this was amazing. Aren't you blown away as well? <laughs> um, we're now having a Q&A session, um, which he himself said is his strength, which I don't believe after this uh, nice performance. Um, but feel free to uh, ask some questions and afterwards you'll have some more time to ask him more about the wingsuits or no, I don't know and uh, then meet him in the afternoon we'll maybe take some pictures or autographs or whatever <laughs> <clears throat> So as a teacher, do you have to hold young people who learn the sport back a lot? Like when they 
go to the extremes? Or? Yeah, we try and, I was young once as well, and if anyone ever told me no, the first thing I would go and do is do what they said no to. So what we do is we've developed the course to try and, again, be the cool uncle. So that um, if you want to go do that, that's awesome. Let's do it together and let's do it safely. So because the day after you finish that course, you're going to go and do it anyway. So we try and do it together with the people and, and, and show them the right way. So we've, we have a few key rules to live by with our school. Um, if you follow those rules and have a good attitude, you're welcome back forever for free. If you break those rules, you're out of the family. And we've only ever had two people that broke those rules. Uh, one was dead within six months and the other one got so busted up that she can't uh, jump anymore. So, so it was really critical for us to um, be progressive but also keep it real. Thanks. What are your rules? Um, there's a few rules. Um, the main one is, if you guys know Lardebrunner, there's a safe area of Lardebrunner and there's a dangerous area of Lardebrunner. The safe area has the longer walks. And the safest jumps in general have longer walks. The dangerous area, which is Steckelberg, has very short walks. So people want to go there straight away. What people forget is that the walk is part of the journey and, and you get to get a feel for the jump and play everything over in your mind and practice the malfunctions and things like that. So once you go to these short walks, then you don't go back to the long walks and you miss out on that whole part of the journey. So one of our rules is you're not allowed to do go down the Steckelberg area for your first season at all. And if you do, you're out. So, um, and people respect that, which is good. So uh, the second rule is you're not allowed to wingsuit base jump for two years because of time in sport. Yeah, no matter how talented you are, the guy that passed away was an amazing human being, but within two months he put a wingsuit on, disobeyed us, um, which is free to do. So there's nothing written. Um, you're allowed to do whatever you want, but you won't be doing it with us. Uh, within six months, unfortunately, he died at 26. Uh, super, super, super sad, yeah. Um, and the other is, just be smart. Be smart about being dumb. Weigh up the pros and cons and make smart decisions. Uh, pick up rubbish, uh, be good to people, um, and you'll have on heading openings. We always bring it back to, to on heading openings. You know, The nicer you are as a person, uh, the more your parish will open nicely. So if people follow just those three rules, um, then they're welcome back all the time. So, and most people have got an understanding now and they respect our rules. Yeah. Uh, on heading openings, for the people who don't know, is that the parachute opens in the same direction than you have been flying before. Correct, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've seen a video of you where you had a 180 flying directly against the wall yeah. and your skill helped you turn around. Yeah, I've had one in 4,000 jumps, yeah, so, so that's all prevention. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, we have another um, skilled, very, very skilled uh, wingsuit base jumper here coming as his entourage and a uh, speed fighter over there, Clem and uh, Nick. Just, <laughs> I can also ask them later, say hi. It's dangerous if you make it dangerous. So like, if you drive a car recklessly, eventually you're gonna have a crash. And it's the same with base jumping. So the thing with base jumping in Lardemar is it's known for it. So we call it Disneyland, and the, and the media call it Death Valley. So, uh, statistically wise, we, uh, the doctor, Dr. Duru, sadly passed away, but he was very pro base. And as far as accidents go in the valley, we are just under mid range of all the accidents. So, of all the sports out there, we're not even really on the radar. But because of the way the media is, and because it's such visually exciting, they do put that out there as a dangerous sport. So, there's no doubt that there is accidents, um, but they, there's like 30,000 safe jumps as well. You know, but because it's such a concentrated valley, uh, they do have accidents there. But these days, so there's so many more jumps that a lot of the pressure is off that the valley now. And we work closely with the authorities and the rescue teams, and, and we put the signs up, this information. We're working on a whole ramp system, um, and we're making it safer and safer. The, the information's out there. It's just that sometimes people don't want to know that information. So that's always until there's a reg until it's completely regulated, which I don't really want you're always going to get rogue people, you know, you'll always see someone on the freeway doing the wrong thing. That's just human, human nature. So. Yeah, how do you train for that? Or how do you know if you're talented? Or, I mean, you have to jump at one time. How can you prepare? Co correct, yeah. So it's like, if I compare it to driving a car, um, when you get your driver's license, you don't step straight into a Formula One car. 
you're already learning on a nice casual car and you slowly build up. And if you want to be a race car driver, that's where you'll, you'll head towards. So, and it's the same with jumping. So first, uh, you'll go and do a skydive, see if you like it. These days it's a tandem, so you can just sit there dumb and happy and have a good time. If you like that, then you can train for your AFF course. And that, now with the invention of the wing, seat, uh, the wing tunnels, you can actually go and fly indoors normally to get your experience up on that. And that's actually going to end up in an Olympic sport very soon. It's, it's taken off. So once you get that and you get to skydiving, and there's a lot of regulations in skydiving, and it's actually an extremely safe sport. So there's even a computer in there that if something happens to you, it will open automatically. So from then on in, um, if you want to choose the base jumping aspect of everything, then you will focus your training on, on tracking um, and can it be accuracy, so landing on the target. Because it can it, what we didn't talk about here is normal base jumping, and it's all about parachute flying. Um, so then we'll direct you on how to train for that. Uh, with our school, we won't let you come on our course unless you have 300 skydives. And we'll give you a whole training program to do to get to that point. Uh, once you start base jumping, so what happens now is all the 20 year old boys, then they come into the course, they go, I just want a wingsuit proxy fly. Looks so cool. We're like, awesome. Let's just do this course first and see what you think. And by the end of the course, they're like, well, I'm not going to do that for years and years and years. So that's why we're developing training programs to get towards that now. But it never used to be like that. It used to be big balls, small brains, and now small balls, big brains. To keep it going, yeah. So, so lots, lots of training and lots of information. And then, like anything in life, you can make it as safe or as dangerous as you choose. And with our sport, which I still love, that's still a choice we have to make. So, yeah, it's up to you. How much is your life worth to you? It's a personal decision. Uh, for me, it's worth everything. So I'll do whatever it takes to be safe, but still have fun. Yeah. How's the number of women in this sport? I mean, you didn't really talk about pioneer women. And which is it. quite funny. We talked about this in the article. So uh, I had specific topics I had to talk about tonight. Yeah, so women in sport, epic. So the two pop, true pioneers of the sport, but not weak suiting, were women. So Anne Halliwell and Marta Epinotti, they've been in the sport for 35 years. They're still jumping, they're still awesome. Uh, best friends of mine. Um, that was the wife of the guy without the parachute, without the pilot suit, so she would have killed him. Um, and they are true pioneers of the sport, they're incredible. So when it started, there's only a few women, because it was a risk risky sport. And as I said in we were chatting earlier, women are smarter than men. So, in fact. So, while guys were like, oh yeah, I'm going to do that, it looks cool. Women are like, boy, that's dangerous. You know, so it's very small in that respect. But now that the technology's gotten better and the information's gotten better, there's a lot more women in the sport, which is really good. There's pros and cons to it. Uh, the pro, the, the, the say pros and cons, so women will use themselves to get ahead in the sport, sometimes. But men will also prey on women to get laid in the sport. So we're finding this is happening a lot more. So what we do with our school now is we don't have that. Yeah, it's, it's hard to explain unless you're in the sport, but it does happen. Uh, guys are giving girls wrong information um, and putting them in situations like jumping situations that are quite dangerous. So now we're running our first ladies' day in August where we're just coaching women. So like a female gym where they can go and exercise without having to deal with dudes. We're running the same thing for, for base jumping girls in Lardabrun in August. So um, more and more women are getting into all extreme sports and the profile is getting lifted as it gets safer, which is awesome. So, cool. You can also do uh, wingsuiting in Stockholm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, two, the, in the wingsuiting, the two main instructors are women in the tunnel. Yeah, so, so they're awesome. So I'm super pro women in sport, absolutely. Yeah. I have a question. Um, how is it, uh, it's maybe a little controversial, um, and I'm not going to say any names, but um, like big companies will um, find people to uh, do jobs for them um, for like spectacular videos or something. How do you think is the um, risk management of the base jumpers themselves that will be able to, to maybe do that decision? in like being safe completely yeah. and not being influenced by money or... It has happened and money does influence things, for sure. Um, if you watch a Travis Pastrana's documentary, 199 Lives, that will explain it perfectly, risk versus reward. Um, and this is still up to the jumper's choice. So I know the Swiss guy Bully that passed away was under a lot of pressure from Red Bull back in the day, um, but it's still his choice to jump. So I've done a lot of jobs where I just haven't got paid, I just wouldn't jump. So it still comes down to personal choice. 
After the big spate of accidents around, especially 2016, that all stopped. You know, so Red Bull aren't taking any more athletes. Monster don't take athletes. Uh, most companies will not touch base. Don't they? Uh, Adidas dropped all their sponsors, all their athletes. Um, it's very difficult to get sponsorship now in base jumping. Yeah, because of that fact. But I don't think the sponsors are pushing because it's still your choice. You're the expert. Um, that some people see short term, see dollar signs, and don't see the bigger picture. Yeah, because I feel that has gotten better. So mm -hmm. it has. It's just that the again, where I've taken the the education route because the sport has been tarnished so much that that's, we're just too left field. You know, I was um, we approached Red, uh, sorry, Red Rip Curl back in two thousand and two, and I was super stoked. They were like, yes, 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 but. We can't use you, you're too left field. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to get um, a skateboard, you can just buy a skateboard. But to actually base jump, you've got to learn the squat off first. There's a whole process, and you have to be an adult to do it. So, so it's very hard for that process to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry, I'm getting that yeah. How did you, how did you find your life before you started teaching? Uh, like, well, I've been teaching off and on since 2003. So with limited information, um, as we as we learn, we, we developed. But um, my life is awesome. Yeah, it's crazy. Like especially from two thousand and three onwards. Like before two thousand and three, it was just all bells and whistles, <coughs> young, going crazy. You know, uh, two thousand and three, my my one of my mentors passed away, um, and that that shook me up. And then uh, at the end of two thousand and three, my mum died of cancer, and then. In December 2003, I won the World Championships of base jumping, and then in March 2004, I watched my girlfriend die skydiving. So that started the roller coaster of carnage, you know. And then, and then after that, it's just gotten crazy and crazy. So, um, also, I also think the classic like everyone, it can't happen to me, but it was happening to a lot of my friends. So I learned from all my friends, um, and to this day, the risk, the the reward versus risk used to be like this. And now it's definitely like this. So, and sometimes I'll go way up. So every winter now, I'll take five months off jumping and go skiing, snowboarding, and, and just do other stuff. Um, and I try and I feel like I've been given a gift to be able to help others do it safely. And so I get so much joy of helping others. And whilst doing that, it also grounds me back to day one. So I do every jump with my students, and it brings me back to the basics, which helps me with complacency and knowing my limits. And you learn to, instead of looking at life like this and jumping like this, you learn to open your periphery uh, and enjoy the journey in a different way. So it's very hard to, for a racing car driver, Formula One driver, to go back to driving a Volkswagen Beetle. But he can find the pleasure in that if he chooses to. And so what I've done now is I've found the pleasure in other aspects of the sport that are going to keep me alive and safe until I'm old, hopefully. That's good. And one small addition, because we've also had a um, short interview with him before this lecture, he also mentioned the community uh, there. He said a lot, uh, a big part of base jumping is not only jumping with other people, but it's also just the community and like being with people who share the same passion. Yeah, family, you know. It's, a, it's like surfing a wave. It's only a tiny part of surfing. It's all paddling and all this other stuff in the community. It's the same with base jumping and skydiving. At the end of the day, what you what you learn over the years and what you do, you don't realize when you start is it's all about having a beer and, and, and some dinner at the end of the day with your mates. That's, that actually ends up what's the most important thing. Once you're dead, no one, no one remembers you. So Dwayne Weston, does anyone know Dwayne Weston? No, the best base jumper that ever lived, but no one remembers him because he's dead. He should be here talking instead of me. So at the end, once you once you go through a bit of a journey like I have. Uh, staying alive and, and hanging out with your mates becomes the, the ultimate rush as such rather than the jumping. The jumping is just an excuse to get together. By the way, we're also going to have a beer later. <laughs> a few more questions. <laughs> it's extreme proximity flying, like going for the five meter hole or whatever. And that really ever be done safely? Yeah, well, it's like everything can be done safely at least once, you know, but if you repeat and repeat and repeat, so. If, Uh, there's another guy that went through a hole that's literally only big enough to fit a wingsuit, you know. And, um, you know, eventually something will happen for sure. But it's a personal choice. So life is a personal choice and we're regulated by everything in our lives these days. This sport is unregulated, so you can actually make that choice yourself. For me, no go, you know. So like, I, as I said before in, in an interview, there's no way you'll see me on ice skates. 
Because for me, that's deadly. That's the most dangerous sport in the world. Ice skating, no. But we will be flying. I feel comfortable and safe. So it's a personal thing for everyone. Okay, I'd say we'll have like two more questions and then uh, you can ask him personally over a beer, <laughs> which he is well deserved as well. So you said that at the time you were scared and you stopped for 12 months so of a beer. How did you manage to jump back? So I stopped that aspect of my jumping, which is wingsuit flying, which I class as the most dangerous type of jumping. Um, I went away and did other stuff. So I was still base jumping, I was still teaching, I just didn't do wingsuiting. Um, and, I, and I may have always stopped, you know, I, I gave it up and then I just felt the urge still, I just felt a bit of urge to do it again. So I went back and trained again and did it the right way. I couldn't even skydive my wingsuit at the start, we'd actually we'd have our wingsuits and then we'd take them off and just jump normally. And, Eventually, I, uh, you know, I had to trust in myself and started from the plane. I did the wind, wind tunnel stuff, which is safe, and got back into it. At the moment, I'm still on the intermediate suits. I have not gone back to the hardcore suits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One more, last question. Do you recall? <laughs> you had a question? Just, is there already like a VA, um, we are glasses wingsuiting in tunnel or something? Yes, there is, yeah. So we actually, in the World Wingsuit League, we actually got given goggles to test them mid-flight with a, with a sensor and a screen in the bottom right-hand corner. Not one of us looked at it. Not one. So we got down and we thought that was pointless. So, um, so there is, I have tried the VR stuff in the tunnel and it's actually really, really cool. Like I, the jump that they show, I'd actually done before in the, in the real. And you actually feel like you're in, in the moment, but you are harnessed in. You can't fly free and do it and kill yourself. Yeah, so you actually feel like you're doing everything. And then you watch the video from the outside and you're completely out of control. Yeah, so, but that will get better and better as, as things go on. Yeah, and there's a lot of people working on that right now. Yeah. But that might help you with not wanting to wing suit, but at the same time have the joy of flying. No, it's a, the accident. makes you dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool. cool. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, I think another round of applause is... Uh, <laughs>